Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our MPC Online Bible Study. Each uh, Tuesday night, we have a thought to think about, a question to ponder, and a text to study. Uh, my name is Matthew McGlade. I'm the lead and teaching pastor here at Mansfield Pentecostal Church. And we are continuing our uh, Bible study series at the moment, titled the, the Magnificent Christ. And we're looking at the victory that Jesus has accomplished for us in his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and his, in his present office in heaven as our, as our high priest. And this comes obviously at the end of our a uh, few weeks of Bible study that we did on the atoning work of Christ that he accomplished for us on the cross. Now, recently, for the last two weeks, as part of this uh, Bible teaching series, we've been looking at the evidence, the historic evidence around the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, you remember we said that there are three pieces of historic evidence that our Christian faith is built upon. Uh, the first piece of evidence was the empty tomb. Uh, the tomb was empty. Uh, the body of Jesus has still not yet been found and it remains empty. That is powerful evidence for the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. The second piece of evidence we looked at uh, was the appearances of Christ. Sometimes we call them the post-mortem appearances of Jesus to his followers. And remember that we said last week that these are appearances of not visions. You know, a vision is something that someone has in their mind's eye. An appearance is something that is happening in the real physical world here uh, in this current world. And so uh, the disciples and the, the women, they all had appearances of Jesus. But the third piece of evidence uh, for Jesus' resurrection, I actually think this is probably the most powerful piece of evidence, is the origin of the Christian belief in the resurrection. Now, this may sound unusual, but the truth is this. How on earth did a group of followers of this renowned, newly fledging, new, uh, newly formed Jesus movement, how on earth did these people come up with this belief that the founder of their faith actually rose from the dead? This demands an explanation. Now, as you remember, when we looked at the last two pieces of evidence, we looked at the historic facts and we looked at the rival explanations to those facts and um, to the view that Christ rose from the dead. And we're going to do the same thing again when it comes to this piece of evidence, the origin of the belief that Jesus actually rose from the dead. How did this come about unless Jesus actually did rise from the dead? You see, some people have alleged that this belief that Jesus rose from the dead was something that was concocted by the early church, uh, maybe in the 300s or 200s, and, uh, and, um, and that it was just used as a means by the church to sort of validate its, its authority or to stamp its authority. That explanation says nothing about how the church came to existence in the first place. But the truth is this. The evidence shows us that from the very beginnings of the Christianity, from the earliest writings of the Christian faith, it was always held and it was always believed that the founder of this movement actually rose from the dead after being crucified and after being, after being put to death. Now we see this very clearly even in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And many scholars hold that in Paul's letters, and some of these letters were written as early as 30 years after Jesus' death and burial. In his letters, many scholars believe that Paul was actually quoting Christian hymns and songs that were written from as early as 10 or 5 or 10 years after Jesus' death and burial. For example, when writing to the church uh, of Ephesus, Paul quotes a song, quote, Paul quotes a hymn that was sung amongst the early believers. And it was this, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And so that was a song that Christians and the early church sung, and they all believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Again, when um, in his letter to the church of Philippi, and many scholars believe that, that in this second chapter, 
Paul was actually rewording a famous Christian hymn that was sung in those days, reflecting the creedal belief that Christ rose from the dead. Let me read it to you. Who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something uh, uh, to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that was recorded in AD 62, 30 years after Jesus' death and burial. Again, when Paul was writing to the church of the Colossians in his first chapter, he was rehearsing a well-known creedal belief that many believers, Christian believers, held on to. And we read this, Paul, Paul writes this, that the sum is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things that have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead. That's the resurrection. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things in in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so the early dates of these creedal beliefs that were encapsulated in some of these early Christian hymns clearly showed that there was this conviction that there was this belief amongst Christians that Jesus of Nazareth did in fact rise from the dead. This was not something that was concocted by the church hundreds of years later in history. That is a complete fallacy. All the evidence shows us that this was a belief that Christians held on to from the earliest of times. And so this belief in Jesus' resurrection stands in contrast to any expectation of that the, that the Jewish Messiah would rise from the dead. You know, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, when he died on that cross, any hope that the disciples had that Jesus would be their Messiah died that day. They would have been completely devastated. Um, you know, that, that, that their leader, who they had pinned so many hopes upon, who would rise up and defeat maybe the Romans and set the new messianic kingdom on earth, their hopes were completely dashed that day when they saw their teacher and their leader nailed to the cross and and dead. All the hopes that they pinned upon Jesus were crushed, were completely crushed. But something changed in these disciples that turned them into fearful, uh, fearful men to actually boldly proclaiming throughout the whole of the known Roman world at that time that their Messiah, who they saw die on the cross, had indeed actually been raised from the dead. And this truly demands an explanation. Because unless Jesus actually did rise from the dead, how can we account for this belief? Now, some people have suggested that maybe the disciples of Jesus borrowed this this idea of rising from the dead. Because by the way, this notion of rising from the dead, no one had even thought about it, okay? So maybe some people suggest that maybe they borrowed this idea of rising from the dead from pagan influences, maybe from the Greek 
or Roman culture or maybe from the Egyptian culture. So for example, uh, in Egyptian mythology and, 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 and paganism, there's this myth that um, Osiris, the, the Egyptian god, had supposedly come up from the underworld and come back to life. Uh, however, many ancient scholars have demonstrated that this myth, like a lot of myths in the pagan world, offer no comparison to the belief of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, so much so that one scholar by the name of Metinger says this, there is, far, there is, as far as I'm aware, no evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct, drawing on the myths and the rites of dying and rising gods in the surrounding world. So the, the idea that the disciples borrowed this idea from, from a, a pagan culture, there's no evidence to support that whatsoever. Others have suggested that maybe the disciples got this idea from their Jewish background, uh, from, from Jewish sources. However, although the Jews did believe that there would one day be a general resurrection at the end of history, do you remember when uh, Martha came to Jesus and uh, about her brother, dead brother Lazarus, and and uh, Martha said that there will be a resurrection at the end of history. That was just the general Jewish belief. No Jew believed that there will be a resurrection in history, let alone that their own Messiah would die such a terrible death. And we see this particularly in the words of, of Jesus' disciples when they were coming down from the mountain after Jesus was transfigured to his disciples. Mark records this and he says that as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And they kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first and so Jesus here predicts his resurrection but I want you to notice the response of the disciples they are confused they don't understand what Jesus means by rising from the dead and they ask this question why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first because in their minds any notion of there being a resurrection was going to be an event that would happen at the end of history at the end of time and uh, first century Jews were taught by their rabbis that at the end of history, at the end of time, that Elijah would come again before the great and terrible day of the Lord at the end of history. And so the disciples could not understand the idea of a resurrection occurring in history prior to the end of the world. And so Jesus' prediction of him rising from the dead only confused them. The scholar N.T. Wright has done exhaustive study on this and he has found that of all the pagan literature in the first century, there are no myths of gods dying and coming back to life. As well as this, the resurrection in the Jewish context had a completely different meaning, which the disciples have come to believe. They believed that the resurrection was something that would happen at the end of time uh, for, for the righteous. And so given this, the best explanation to the belief that Jesus rose from the dead is indeed the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead. Jesus' followers had no expectation that their Messiah would rise from the dead. From their upbringing, upbringing after the crucifixion of Jesus, all, the only thing that they could hope for was wait for the general resurrection for, of the dead at the end of history, when they would see their, their master again. But the empty tomb and Jesus' appearances to them over a period of 50 days convinced them that Jesus really had physically risen from the dead and therefore 
Given that the origin of their belief can't be explained by pagan influences or even by Jewish influences, the only other explanation that for the belief that Jesus rose from the dead is the fact that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. So that, friends, tonight is our thought to think about. A question to ponder. And the question is this. Why can the origin of the disciples' belief that God raised Jesus from the dead not be explained by pagan or Jewish influences? So why can the origin of the disciples' belief that Jesus rising from the dead not be explained by pagan or Jewish inferences. And I'd also like you to read, as a text of study, I'd like you to read John chapter 11, verses 17 to 24. And as you're studying that text, I want you to have a go at answering this question. What does Martha's response tell us about what the Jews believed about the resurrection of the dead? So what does Martha's response tell us about what the Jews believe about the resurrection from the dead. Well, guys, hope you got something out of that tonight. Next week, we're going to look at the nature of Jesus' resurrection and why that gives us incredible hope. Hey, guys, have a great rest of the evening and a great rest of the week. Uh, see you later on. God bless you all.